There was some kind of drive in me that said, there is something more, and I want that something. And another, you know, highlight of my whole life was to play with Dizzy Gillespie. But whatever blindness robbed them off, they still have a lot of riches inside. Go ahead. Touche, right in the heart. Good job. Major funding for Arab American Stories was provided by Mohammed and Jamie El Arian, the Arab American Community of Michigan, the Arab American Community of Houston, Texas, the American Syrian Arab Cultural Association of Michigan. Additional funding was provided by Sometimes life takes you to places you never imagined. Denied a college education, Diane Rehm worked and studied her way into prominence on the nation's airwaves. Rabi Amin found his way from a grade school project to a career as one of the top drummers in Afro-Cuban jazz. And Rabia Dow, who was blinded in the Lebanese Civil War, now works to rehabilitate other blind people in Boston. The world knows Diane Rehm as a fearless and adept interviewer. But her prominence on the nation's airwaves would most likely surprise her parents, who had no such expectations for their daughter's future. Thanks for joining us. I'm Diane Rehm. A little more than a year ago, Greece received She was born and raised in the close-knit Syrian Christian community in Washington, D.C. And no easy passage existed between the world of her family and the outside world. In 1929... My father went back to the old country, to Alexandria, Egypt, where my mother was living. And she was engaged to someone else. But he, because the families knew each other, I guess my father's proposal took precedence. He married her in April of 1929, took her on a wonderful honeymoon, and came here. Just one problem, and that is that my dad had his entire family with him. My mother had to leave her entire family behind, and I think that was hard. I can still see her writing letters in beautiful Arabic um, to her mother quite frequently and still see those letters coming with that airmail stationery, that blue airmail stationery with the rim, and she looked forward to those letters so much. I think she had a hard time with two young girls who were very much a part of the American community, whereas she strictly a part of the Syrian community. As I finished writing my own book, all of a sudden it occurred to me, think of the courage my mother had to leave her family behind. She saw her mother once more when I was 12. And my grandmother came, and she could speak no English. And of course, I could speak very little Arabic, but she taught me. And we would sit on the front porch together. She was a smoker. She had this long black silk hair, and I used to touch her hair and feel it, and she'd pass me a cigarette and let me smoke with her on the front porch, which my mother, of course, never knew. But my grandmother had a very different attitude from that of my mother. She was easygoing. She was 
filled with laughter and joy, and that's what makes me wonder about my mother. Had she been able to stay in her own country, would she have been a happier person? I knew I had to find more in life. I was perhaps just more ambitious. Uh, and I know ambition is kind of a strange word to use in there, but I think there was some kind of drive in me that said there is something more out there and I want that something. Why in the world would he be interested in this little Arab girl with no education, uh, from humble beginnings, of course, I found out his beginnings were humble as well, but nevertheless, the excitement of ideas. And he became the teacher and I, the pupil, for so many years until I began to break out from that as well. Most of the women of my generation whether Arab American or otherwise, we're at home and happy at home. And, you know, I was happy at home too, but I just knew I wanted something more. This sounds like raising the debt ceiling here in this country. Very similar. Very similar thing. When, when Mexico came to the U.S. in 1981 and said, we, we can't pay, what did the Greek ambassador say to you afterwards? He said he had a really nice time being on. He Isn't was happy to be nice? invited. He yeah. was so cute. He was, and, and like I was saying, I thought he, compared to a lot of ambassadors or how much they might feel they're able to say, I thought, you know, he said more than I expected. Exactly. Really. Did you think that he was praying? He confessed that most of them avoid taxes. <laughs> uh, that, uh, that example about 300 people say they have swimming pools and yeah. about 6,000 right. <laughs> from an aerial view right. actually do. So that was fun. Both programs were really terrific. Mondays are hard, but those shows were really good. So I thank you. I can remember how excited I was to get up each morning and go through the newspapers and start thinking, what ideas can I offer? What's new? What's in the news? And then taking them into an office, tiny little office. But how wonderful an experience, really. What kind of job did the media do? Well, this was far from uh, the media's uh, finest hour. And, and you know, Diane, you asked me at the beginning why I set out to do the book. It's obvious that we can't set the record straight about the anthrax letter attacks and then learn lessons from them that apply directly to our public safety without letting the chips fall where they may. David Willman, his new book is titled The Mirage Man, Bruce Ivins, The Anthrax Attacks, and America's Rush to War. Congratulations on your book. Thank you so much, Diane. Thanks for listening, all. I'm Diane Rehm. The Diane Rehm Show is produced by Sandra Pinker, oh. Nancy Robertson, Susan My Neighbors, goosebumps are still here from that one caller, one that sister. That is Adler. absolutely amazing. Is I tried everything I could to talk to Catherine Price and never was successful. Really? So here was obviously her or sister. Your, your, your show is amazing. The reach you say. This is incredible. Man. You know, I don't know if they'd be proud or they'd be embarrassed, or they'd be wondering what in the world I was about, because my life is so different from anything either of them ever had or perhaps even imagined. His grandparents come from Lebanon, but drummer Robbie Amin is a driving force in Afro-Cuban jazz. 
He reflects on the differences between the culture you're born into and the culture in which you live and how they work together in his life. Running, it's your captive audience. So I listen to music and I also learn music if I have to learn music. And I mean, I play every day and I love practicing and I love, but if I have to learn something, I just put it on the back burner. And running, you have no choice. I put the headphones on and I learn the music on the hour run. One of the longest relationships I've had is with Ruben Blades, salsa singer, poet, actor, lawyer, a true Renaissance man. That's one person that I've really always treasured and continue to work with. And another, you know, highlight of my whole life was to play with Dizzy Gillespie. I didn't really feel like I deserved to be on the record. I had only been in New York a couple of years, and the guys from the record company called me and said, what are you doing today? And I went to the studio, met him, we played together for a while, and then the band came and we just started recording. So it was one of those things I didn't have even a chance to get nervous, think about like the whole, wow, the implications and all that. I got started on drums. It was a project in the elementary school and we had to make Native American instruments, which would be drums. So I got these inner tubes of tires and stretched them over these, uh, these cans with uh, shoelaces and chopsticks. And then I kind of made a little drum set out of that. My parents knew that I wanted to be a musician even before I went to college. So I had the opportunity to go to a really good college and my father said, you should go and study whatever you want, which was a true luxury, knowing you're gonna do something else when you graduate because it'll probably help you in a more of an abstract way, which I think is actually really true. Conrad Herwig always, when he introduces me on the bandstand, he, he, he always says um, uh, his father let him go to Yale so long as he promised that he'd keep up playing jazz drums to have something to solid to fall back on. <laughs> Great drummers on the planet today. Please put your hands together. Robbie Amin. Robbie Amin. All right, thank you very much. Uh, you're listening to the uh, the Days in the Life Band. Uh, now we're going to play a song that has some, um, as the Latinos say, Arabic influences. Uh, it's the hometown of uh, my mother's parents, and it's in Lebanon. And uh, I wrote this song. Uh, you know, thinking about my past, my ancestry, and I really wrote it so I could maybe get a gig in Lebanon. Right. So. <laughs> Both of my parents were born in the United States, but all sets of grandparents came from Lebanon. My mother's parents were from uh, Baklin, uh, and uh, they were Abu Ismail was their family name, but they changed that to Sam's, because I think they knew of an American guy named Sam, so they figured we put an S, sounds good, Sam's. This will be the last name when they came over. My mother's from Michigan, my father's from Virginia, and they met, and they're both Druze, which is a mystic religion. That's your grandma, great grandmother, and some of her kids, because she had a lot of kids. My father wasn't born yet. Really? Mm -hmm. Look at him. Mi amor, ven para que tu veas eso. La foto. It all depends on. My wife is Cuban, Ana. I speak Spanish almost half the time. 
even though I'm of Arab origin, I'm really known for my Afro-Cuban style, which is kind of funny on the other side because most, you know, Latinos that I meet are always surprised to find out that I'm not, um, you know, Latino. Our daughter, Lucia Zaina, she's a Lebanese Cuban. Fortunately, if, if she was only Lebanese Cuban, it would be a kind of a messed up passport to have travel wise Cuban Lebanese passport, but she's got a US passport. My first marriage was to a Lebanese American. We have a son, Tajreed. He goes by Taji. My son, at one time, was a pretty successful skateboarder. And I've done many, many, many records over the years, but usually as a side man or co-leader, and I felt it was be important to write almost all the music and the arrangements if it was going to be my record. When I thought about who I wanted to play on this record, you know, you want, you want to play with your, with your friends, being concert musicians. We actually just knocked it out in two days, and you get a little bit of magic that way when you're talking about that kind of experience and that kind of friendship. You know, your blood stays with you, but culturally, the people you spend all your time with, even as a kid, music, things like that, it's kind of who you are, more than just your blood. Rabia Dao was born in the small town of Zarun in the hills of Mount Lebanon. He lost his eyesight in an explosion when he was 16 and came to the United States for medical treatment. For the past 12 years, he's been Director of Rehabilitation at the Carroll Center for the Blind in Newton, Massachusetts. I was injured in the Lebanese Civil War. I lost my, my eyesight, my, uh, my left hand, and. More importantly, my 15-year-old brother at the same time. So, you know, Lebanon was at war, raging war, and I came to this country um, with the support of uh, American Arab Anti-Discrimination Committee, who brought a few of us to this country for um, medical treatment. Art is an attempt to understand, yielding pleasure in the attempt, whether or not, we understand. In other words, it is a fun process, and it's also a very rewarding process. This is the view from the front porch of my family's home in Mount Lebanon, where I grew up, with two doling and overprotective parents. And yet, we lived in a country torn by pretty violent civil war. Life is full of journeys. We plan some and we fall into others by circumstances out of our control. The journey through loss is one of those journeys. And so long ago and far away from here, my life journeys began at this metaphoric place.
So, if you look back at this, it's all due to the war. You know, my, uh, you know, we're not we're not any different than any other family, I guess. Maybe we had more tragedies than others, but um, you know, my family lost family business a few times during the war, uh, in a direct hit or robbery or what have you, and so so it's the impact of war that's not seen, that is not you know measured as a direct you know bullet or <laughs> um, bomb. Uh, hit. Um, nonetheless, it's a devastation of the war. Well, the seed of, of, of my interest in painting goes back to a class I had when I was in middle school years ago in an art class where we did a project um, it was actually for Mother's Day. The only rectangular shaped one or square shaped one. Like there are two women kind of flying in the air. I think Picasso was the one who said, I, I don't paint what, what I see, I paint what I think. A and, you know, everybody who sees something gets a perspective on what they're seeing. I paint on uh, clear glass. Um, I actually buy the glass from an auto body shop and they're <laughs> always intrigued by what is this blind guy doing with all those circles. So what do you think happened here? Where is the cane user? This painting is more about the viewer's state of mind than that of the cane user. How do we perceive blindness? What is this painting indicative of? Anger? Recklessness? Fun? Tragedy? Rest, challenge, despair, confidence, peace. What is our perception of this painting says about us as people working in this field? Vision rehab is a fascinating and, and really rewarding world. It truly is an art of its own. Ready? Right. Do shake, good job, nice going. Right upper chest, perfect shot. Like that confidence, that's a good job. I don't know, Arnold, you're gonna have your hands full next week. <laughs> Our fencing program at the Carroll Center is part of, of developing orientation to space as we move in space. And uh, we are the only um, rehabilitation services for the blind in the world that uses that tool in rehabilitation, and we have been doing it for about 50 years. All done. Good. Good move. Good analysis. Good. When we first tell people that they're going to be in fencing classes, the initial reaction is, it's a joke, then they're, they're fearful. By doing that, you're giving them uh, a permission not just to launch and hit your target in fencing, but that confidence that if I could do this, what else can I do? Well, I want to go back to work. I want to be able to function. I want to be able to read. I want to be able to do things that most normal people do, which I haven't been able to do for years. And I told my wife one day, I said, I need to, need to use a cane so I can get out and get, get out by myself safely. And my counselor told me this would be a good place for me to learn mobility. Look in the direction you're moving. Okay, visualize me in front of you. Visualize your target. Take measure again. Go ahead. Touche, right in the heart. Good job. So now, Stay ready. When I say fence, extend, lunge. Ready? Fence. Touche. Nice job. Right under the heart. Good job. Now I want you to have some more confidence with behind that lunge. Okay? Lunge like you mean it. Okay? Ready? And now we came and we met people that had no vision since birth. We met some people that lost vision in their 20s and 30s. And like Mr. Dow, you know, they go around, they do everything. You don't know they don't have vision until they, until they tell you. What, what's interesting is how many times people surprise themselves or whatever blindness robbed them off or caused in their life. They still have a lot of riches inside. I hope you're all set, okay? Yes, sir. Thank Good you. job, thank you. Walt Disney said, if you can dream it, you can do it. And, and, and for the most part, I mean, this is really what the American culture has, you know, 
has given me is that uh, just just try. Nothing is impossible. Give it a try. I am Neda Ulabi. Hope to see you next week for more Arab American stories. Major funding for Arab American Stories was provided by Mohammed and Jamie El Arian, the Arab American Community of Michigan, the Arab American Community of Houston, Texas, the American Syrian Arab Cultural Association of Michigan. Additional funding was provided by 